Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for coming. I'm really uh, happy today to, after about a year of trying to get Mike, uh, Michael up here, um, to introduce uh, Mike or Michael Lerma, um, who's uh, an associate professor of political science at, at Northern Arizona University. Uh, I know Michael very well. Um, I like to claim credit for him because I like to claim credit for all of my successful students, but I think my only credit I can claim is that like I drove you from political science. <laughs> he was reminding me as we were talking, um, like for you graduate students who like thought I was a real jerk when I was a grad director, he was reminding me just how less of a jerk I am than I must have once been. <laughs> um, You're mellowed out. And half the stories I don't, I half the stories I don't believe are true, um, but he claims that they are. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so Michael started his uh, graduate program when I was at University of Arizona, and I got to know Michael very well um, in the context of uh, being a student of mine. Um, Michael later went on to get a PhD in American Indian Studies from U of A in, in uh, 2010. Uh, since then, he's been uh, a very successful scholar publishing um, most recently uh, the book um, Indigenous Sovereignty in the 21st Century, which is the basis of today's talk. Um, and then uh, next January, there's coming January, he has a forthcoming book with Oxford University Press um, entitled Guided by Mountains, um, Trends in Contemporary Approaches to Diné um, Governance. And, and uh, Michael's background, he's a member of the Purapecha tribe and uh, grew up in California, almost went to UC Davis. And with that, welcome to UC Davis and <laughs> off you go. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, what time is it? Good afternoon. Is that appropriate? Um, yeah, just uh, thank you, Brad, for bringing me out. Um, I was, um, just so you know, Adrian, my co-conspirator, is here. She's going to take pictures, so yeah. Um, so yeah, don't mind her if she gets in your face, takes a shot at you. Um, anyway, um, yeah, just... Uh, Brad and I have known each other for a while, and just uh, I was telling him the story about the time when he called me on the phone and said, hey, you want to go to grad school at U of A? And I was like half asleep. And, yes. We can all throw all this money at you, and it wasn't that much money, but to me it was the most money I'd ever heard in my life. You want to make $10,000 a year? Yes. <laughs> Do you want free tuition for a year? Uh, yeah, and I'm trying, like, don't sound like you're asleep. Don't sound like you're asleep. And um, he, of course, he forgot that conversation, but, uh, you know, I'll, ne I'll never forget it because it really changed my life. That the, the final one that he said on the, on the phone was, do you want to get flown out and check out the program? It wasn't a, exactly as excited as I'm making him sound, but you guys know him, not me. Probably that. Yeah. <laughs> and so you want to come out? I'd never been on a plane before in my life. You know, it's, I call my mom, I think, oh my God, they want to fly me out. Why? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but I'm glad that uh, I got that call. Um, but yeah, UC Davis is such a, uh, an interesting place in my life because of, um, you know, I was a transfer student from a community college. Uh, and I know I'm not talking about my book yet, but I apologize. I'm go I go off on tangents sometimes. And, um, so I, I, I got out of Allen Hancock College. I saw the best um, gag fortune cookie the other day, and it really hit home. I cracked it open, and it says, just get a degree in liberal arts. Figure it out later. And that's exactly what I did with my life. <laughs> I went and I got a liberal arts degree in, Amer in, 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 in an AA degree in liberal arts, and um, I had no idea what I was going to do after that, and just knew that, well, i got to go get a BA, I guess. And UC Davis was one of the places that I ended up applying for. Uh, back in those days, you would get uh, a fee waiver. Back in those days, applying to the UC was 40 bucks. I don't know what it is now, but it was 40 bucks. Um, and, I, and I didn't have 40 bucks. And so I asked, can I have some free waivers? And they gave me three. So one of them I applied to Davis. And get in a car and I drive up here and I'm just, how do you pick a university? I have no idea. And I just looked around. And it looks pretty, I guess. And so um, ended up at UC Santa Cruz. But that's another story. And, um, and then I came back here again. 
in, when I was interested in the PhD in Native American studies, back in the days of Jack Forbes was still hanging around here and kicking up dust. And uh, so, so yeah, I keep crisscrossing with UC Davis, and so it's it's uh, it's great to be able to come back and um, be invited into a room for once instead of just hanging outside and maybe not being invited in the room. So I, I really appreciate. And, and I'm glad, I'm really happy to see all these faces. And it really makes me feel good that we'll have a good time. So I figure I'll talk for about 40 minutes or so, more or less, and we'll go to questions. Is that what you want? Does that sound all right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, l lately I feel like P.T. Barnum. I'm going to send this around, but there's, um, there's uh, more of these little things. If you want to keep it, go ahead. But this is just the cover of the next book that's coming out, Guided by the Mountains. I know you can't hardly see it now, but um, um, I had a, a friend of mine, Klee Benali, put this together for me as a graphic. He's uh, the net activist out there trying to protect the sacred mountains from yellow snow is what we call it. Because uh, uh, one of these, if, if you see it in here, you can see there's four mountains. And that, that's supposed to demarcate the traditional homelands of Navajo Nation. Uh, the Nempikea is what they call it. And um, this third one is, is, the, is, these are real mountains that actually exist in Google Earth if you want to go look them up. Some people think it's a myth, but it's not. They're really there. And uh, this third one is um, called the San Francisco Peaks in Spanish. I guess they never got around to giving it an English name. But uh, the Spanish got there first, and they named it. Um, and, but from a Navajo cosmology point of view, it's called Dolco Asli. And it's the western boundary of that traditional homeland. And th it isn't the only nation that claims it as well. Uh, I think 13 or 14 different nations, they have these uh, ties to this uh, sacred mountain. And meanwhile, a, uh, a ski company uh, is uh, blowing up um, artificial snow onto the mountain and medicine people don't really like that because they say it's sort of interfering with the relationship between Mother Earth and Father Sky or you're messing with climate, you're messing with weather and they don't think it's really a great idea um, but in the last few years they just started um, they just started piping in um, treated reclaimed water and so they're blowing that on a sacred mountain, um, and and it's uh, and, you know it's it's for profit, as you can imagine. And there's a lot of uh, indigenous activists that are upset about it all. And so anyway, um, so yeah, so just to sort of get these ideas out there about what is sacred, what have you. That's that's why I write. I was just talking to Adrian last night about it too, and. And she was. She asked me that question. Do you remember that exactly how you asked that question? Can I pick on you for a sec? You know, what would happen if we didn't need all this? You know, we didn't need to do this. She was saying something like that. What if there was no call? What if, what if everything was equal? I think that's what, the way you said it. What if females were equal with males? And what if we didn't? Yeah. The wage gap closed. Yeah. Yeah, and I just and I just felt it felt good, and I just said it really happily. Like I'd be out of business. And she's like, that's not good. I was like, no, it's great. I don't want to do this. This, this is hard. It's, it gives me a headache. It's a 500-year-old migraine is what, what Philip Deloria calls it. Um, and then, you know, we go do something else, you know. But, um, but yeah, that was sort of the what-if question of last night. Imagine if I didn't have to do this. You know, I guess I don't have to, but um, I want to because it's, it feels like a, without, without my, my ancestors survived for some reason. So I'm here for some reason. And so... I have to do something. I can't just sit around and do nothing. But uh, yeah, and so one of the one of those topics that that I, intersects with this book here, you know, Indigenous Sovereignty in the Twenty First Century. Um, it's I kept running into. Um, I have to make. I have to pose for a sec. I'm like a model. <laughs> And one of the one of the one of the issues that I ran into a lot is um, you have these younger activists, and they mean well. And I just um, I was I was kind of frustrated with some of the 
the, I guess I was frustrated with the lack of strategy that they carry out when they're trying to do the right thing. And um, not that I know better, but I guess I wanted them to have some more questions about some of the uh, institutions that they're buying into. And when I, when I end up at a graduation somewhere in, at, Nor at Northern Arizona University, it's, it really does my heart good when I, when I hear from these graduating seniors that are Native American and they say, you know what Mike did is that he legitimized creation accounts. You know, and I'll tell you what that is in a sec, if you don't know what it is already. Um, he legitimized creation accounts. He made me feel proud of the fact that I'm Native or that I'm Hualapai or that I'm Dine or whatever I am. Because I get, and I kind of lost sight of that, that I, you know, this, these Western institutions don't do that. And I think a lot of these indigenous activists, they could use some foundation to go back to their creation accounts and say, this is, this is, this is actually a good source to go forward to challenge Western epistemologies, to challenge um, Western assumptions about uh, resource extraction, about our, about our role in the environment, um, and, and whether or not we are to dominate Mother Earth and Father Sky, or we are to cooperate with Mother Earth, Father Sky, that kind of thing. And so that's, that's why I've been talking about these kinds of um, inappropriate relationships with um, a sacred mountain, or in a, a, what I call an inappropriate relationship with um, extracting natural resources. And so I'll start off the talk with, um, you know, what, what does it mean to be sacred? And there was this article that I came across around 2004 when I went to U of A. Um, I, I took this class from Professor Tom Holm. He was an awesome professor. He actually wrote the, um, the forward to this. I, I called him up on the phone. I was like, you never wrote with me, so you owe me a forward. And he says, that's true, all right, I'll do it. And so he wrote the forward and it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that I get to share that with him, you know, now. And uh, so what he ended up, what he ended up coming up with is, um, like he was a faculty member at U of A and he was the junior faculty member. And there was a, another guy who was the associate professor named Vine Deloria. Anybody heard of Vine Deloria? good um, and so Vine was the the associate professor at the time but there was another guy who was the the senior professor his name was Robert K Thomas and I think most people haven't heard of him we've kind of forgotten about that guy and the way Tom tells the story is that it was as Tom was a junior faculty member at U of A and it was his job to go gather three coffees and he would go back to his office and Vine and Robert would show up. And he says, do you know why they'd show up in my office? And why? And he says, because they would smoke in my office and then I'd get in trouble for it. And so, um, so they're smoking away and they're talking and they're talking about, you know, what is, it, what is it to be a people? Not an indigenous people, a people. And they came up with these ideas here. And they ended up putting it out in this, this article, uh, Peoplehood. And um, I was really intrigued by it way back in 2004. And so I feel like it's one of those things that can explain a lot. Um, and, and I always tell people that if, if, if you don't, if you want to know what sacred means, it's probably what sacred means. It's this idea that you have this history, this creation account about where this mountain came from that you have this specific language about that mountain I just talked about called Doko Sleep. That you have this cycle that you have to perform throughout the seasons in order to <coughs> may ensure that the process keeps moving along and there are ceremonial processes that go with it. Oh, look at that. And it's a, it's a place, it's a, it's a geographic space that we, that we see, that we can look at, where we can empirically observe and um, so my question, I guess, is always about, you know it's sacred when you start to see these four pieces intersecting in, in one spot. 
And when it comes to that mountain, Dokosli, when you've got 13 or 14 different names for it from 13 or 14 different nations, and they have 13 or 14 ceremony cycles, and there's 13 or 14 sacred histories, um, I, I think it, it just gives us a lot more uh, substance to go in and, you know, it, it's sacred because we respect it. You know, that, that sounds wishy-washy, I get that. And so I'm trying to get us all to this point where we're being a lot more concrete about what we mean when we say sacredness, uh, attachment, um, respect, reciprocity, um, that you're treating a mountain as though it is your relative because it is your relative because it's a, it actually sustains your life and without that land base there you don't have a life you you won't live literally won't live um, and I, I don't I don't know that we always process things in that way and so I've been having a lot of fun just playing with this idea and saying well what does it mean for sovereignty for example and so um, now let me get to this creation account idea um, does anybody know what a creation account is? Anybody want to give me a definition of what that is? Did I make that up? I don't know. Maybe I did. A myth, a creation myth. Have you ever heard it that way? There's a myth of where these people came from. Has anybody heard it that way? And that was sort of, I've seen some heads say yes. Um, and I, I didn't like that phrase. Um, I didn't like the idea that um, some people just called it mythology. Um, and not that I take it literally, but um, I wanted to find some middle ground between there are these elders out there in communities that take these kinds of accounts seriously. They truly believe that they emerge from the earth in some capacity or another. And um, I, I don't know that the Western world fully understands or appreciates that. I don't know if the youth activists fully appreciate that either. And so, and I don't know that there's any, ever been anybody like myself that's come along and said, hey, wait a minute, you know, there is something to this and maybe you should respect it. Um, and maybe you can actually use it in the 21st century, you know? And I think that's been sort of a mind stretch for a lot of people. And, um, and so I, I wanted to play with those ideas and redefine what it means in terms of indigenous sovereignty. Um, there's this whole Western paradigm of indigenous sovereignty, and there's this whole, um, the idea that native nations have adopted a Western definition of sovereignty. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the history of it all, but I'll talk about it a little bit. It's probably, probably be a good idea to talk about it here, where you have, you have this really interesting conflict, this interesting, um, inconsistency that's happened right here where we're standing. It's this idea that you have this, the, the, the normative foundation of what became the United States of America in conflict with the dispossession of land from indigenous peoples. And, and there's gotta be some legal mechanism in order to justify that. And the way that the Western international law f figured that out way back when was through this idea of aboriginal title or this idea of doctrine of discovery. This idea that I've just discovered you. Um, you'll be the tribe and I'll be a, a colonial actor. And that's a phrase that I use throughout the book um, because if I don't use that, then I feel like I'm really centering things the wrong way. I wanna center it around indigenous peoples. <laughs> and so I kind of take it and I move it around. And so, you know, we're in California. And so the example would be well, what time period am I talking about in California? Is this Spain? Is this Mexico? Is this United States? I'm just going to call him a colonial actor, and I'm going to refocus this on indigenous peoples first and foremost. Um, there's plenty of history books that center it on these various colonial actors. You can go read those. This is what I do. Um, that, that was my attitude about it. And so somebody discovers California. A Christian nation discovers California, and they decide amongst themselves that because we are a Christian nation, we are better than a heathen nation of California Indians. That was, that was international law, legitimate international law for a long time. And so by virtue of that assumption that they are a superior nation, a Christian nation, they claim the right to exclusively extinguish the right 
of the Indian nations to occupy their traditional homeland. You know, they don't say it that way, but that's what I'm saying now. I, I want you to sort of contrast this with, we've just come along and you have the right to occupy your traditional homeland. Cool? Because you're heathens. Now, if you go Christian, you know, maybe we'll talk about it more. But, you know, that never really happens. Um, I, I, I go back to Vine, you know, people, um, if you want to see, if you want to see a, an example of what happens when a native nation bends over backwards to try to appeal to the colonial actor, go to, go to look at Cherokee. Um, Vine Deloria writes about this very nicely and he says, he says, look at the Cherokee nation. Um, he says, back when they were trying to retain their traditional homelands, they did everything. He says they did everything. They, they became farmers, they cut their hair, they wrote their language down, they went to Western education, they owned slaves, and guess what? They still lost their land. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, and so it's, it, it begs the question, like, what can you really do to, to retain your traditional homeland? And it's, it was pretty much an impossible kind of metric there. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's sort of a side note. So this idea of Aboriginal title, this idea that you're, you've been permitted to occupy your traditional homeland at the pleasure of the European sovereign, the Christian sovereign, um, was legitimate international law that was adopted into U.S. domestic law in 1821 with uh, the McIntosh case uh, of the U.S. Supreme Court. And they end up adopting this idea and, and that sort of domesticates this international law and it legitimizes what became the United States. Um, and ultimately making this decision, this, this, this uh, mechanism to where if, if you're conquered, which kind of doesn't happen very often, if you're conquered then you know, you've lost your right to occupy your traditional homeland. It can be bought, and you see treaties that talk about that sometimes. I don't know that we can fully rely on them as legitimately a selling, a, a real estate transaction, um, or if they're abandoned. That's the idea, you know, and I don't know what abandoned means. Um, but we can talk about, you know, smallpox epidemics. We can talk about winter and summer camps where, um, Maybe your land is discovered in the winter time when you're at winter camp and then you come back to summer camp and there's a village there of pilgrims and it's like, oh, you abandoned it. Um, and so you have these various episodes that go on. And, and so in, in my head anyway, when you bring it back to California, for example, um, you, you end up with the original sovereign Spain that's claiming California for itself. They're claiming the right to extinguish Aboriginal title, but now they got to go in and do the work and actually extinguish Aboriginal title, and they fail to do it. Spain fails to do it. Um, Mexico takes a stab at it, and they also fail to extinguish Aboriginal title. And then you get to the United States, and the United States exceed, succeeds, and they begin to extinguish Aboriginal title. They begin to put up these small reservations that are littered throughout California, as you guys may know. And um, even that land isn't unextinguished Aboriginal title. It's, it's, it's extinguished title held in trust by the federal government for the best use of the Indians. And if the best use ends up getting decided by the federal government that you should be terminated, then it will go away. If, it's, if the federal government says it should be allotted for your best interest, then that will happen. And it's, it's pretty unilateral, you know. And it, it ignores all this. It ignores all this, that you have a different kind of relationship with your traditional homeland. Um, and so that's, that's what all the books talk about. Um, and that's what the activists are sort of relying upon. And, and, that, and it was troubling me that you know, something needs to be out there that legitimizes creation accounts or, or a mythology, if you want to use that word. I don't like that word, but uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't get the best books when we're coming up. And so, um, and so this, this idea of this creation account is that you've got a traditional homeland, it's a place, it's, 
it can be demarcated by mountains, rivers, something. And these points might have names in that language. And so, and so I always go back to Navajo because that's the one that I know best. And so from a Navajo perspective, we can talk about this and maybe this will ground it a little more in your head so I don't sound like I'm just talking out of the sky. But this idea of place and water. Um, in, in Navajo way, you have four sacred mountains. And like I said, you can go out and Google Earth and you can see them if you want. And when I fly off to the East Coast, I see the Eastern Mountain, Sisnajin is what it's called. And then you have a Southern Mountain, Salt Zith. And then you have that Western Mountain, Doko Asli. And then you have that Northern Mountain, Deben Itza. And where do, these, where do these mountains come from? Where do these names come from? Why, why do I know these names? Um, and you can see ceremony cycle and you can see specific language and I can talk about that for a second. Um, when, I, when I use the phrase specific language, because that's modified from home, it's, um, it's the idea that, I'm not saying take a left at Sisna Jinn. It's not, it's not just a, a street name. It's, it's a sacred word and it means something pretty meaningful in it. and it's something that I don't fully understand and I don't pretend to fully understand. Um, Brad and I were just talking about this in, in his office. Um, one of the ways that, um, and this is all in that second book that's gonna come out, so I'm sort of merging these ideas together. But one of the ways that these specific um, language terms come out could be in songs. And so there's all these mountain songs that, that, that can be sung. There, there is, there's a word for, the, for a mountain called zith. Zith, and it literally means dirt, but it also means power. And you, when each of these mountains is, is zith, and so you can say it, you can say it, zith na jinnit, zith sot zith, zith toko asli, zith de benitsa, something like that. And there are times when medicine people will go up there and they'll do a ceremony or, and they'll bring some of that dirt back with them and they'll have these representations of this power of this, of this traditional homeland in their home. And it's, it's something that needs to be renewed every now and then. And that's a ceremony cycle. And it's something that the medicine people can sing about. And I've, I've been there when a medicine man will renew those mountain bundles is what they call them. And they can sing mountain songs all night long and they still won't have them all sung out. And they, uh, they end up naming six and sometimes 12 sacred mountains, just depends on, on uh, the situation. And so, so you've got the place, you've got the language, you've got the ceremony. Where did this come from? And that's the sacred history. And so one of those mountains out there is near a place called the Emergence, in a Navajo perspective. And there's this idea that there were there were the the way that the way from a, a lot of indigenous peoples and Navajo people specifically, the way they talk about all of these living things around us is that they're people, and so you can have people with wings, you can have people with hooves. We just happen to be people with five fingers. We're not better than. We're not worse than. We're just we're just here, and there's tree people and all that and water people. Um, and, and so it's more of an equity question than equality. It's, it's that a winged person is much more capable of flying around than a five-fingered person. It doesn't make you better than or worse than. You, you just have special talents that the other won't have. Um, and so they have this idea that um, there was this time where some of these people came up through the earth on a bamboo reed and there were specific animals, people, that were able to bring up <coughs> seeds and that those seeds ended up creating the, the, the vegetation that we have on the earth now within the, the traditional homeland, right? 
and and so they they always talk about these four sacred foods, these four original foods: four, corn, beans, squash, tobacco. And tobacco is a weird one, I know, but you got to pray with something. Um, but corn, bean, squash is is something that I've heard other people talk about. And I remember one time somebody told me that about the three sisters. Like, who? What's their names? What? Like, you know, corn, beans, and squash. They're like, really? You forgot tobacco. And <laughs> and so I, I didn't know that 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 there was some there was other people that had it that way. But um, so but we can leave it at that if we want and just call it corn, beans, and squash. And and so that's a sacred history, and you can sing about that too. And that's how that kind of information is recorded. It doesn't have to be recorded in a book, you know. It, do, it can be recorded in song. It can be recorded in sand painting. It can be recorded in pottery. It can be recorded in a pyramid. Um, and it's, it's really just a question, I think, of expanding our ideas about what does it mean to write it down? What does literacy really mean? And if we're, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna stay married to this idea that it has to be written in in, in, in this alphabet, and it has to be stored in a library, we're gonna miss a lot, and that's, that's really the point of it all. Um, and so that's, that's where this all came from, this idea that let's, let's talk about indigenous sovereignty from this point of view. Let's go back to, there's 568 nations that are federally recognized right now. There are, I don't know how many nations in California that were terminated. I don't know how many nations. I don't know. Has anybody heard about that? That the 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 fact that you have this this stack of treaties between California tribes and the federal government that were never ratified, and so you know you have all you have all these people that are kind of nations that are missing pieces of themselves. Um, and and one of the one of the greatest ways that I heard uh, an, an Australian st scholar talk about it. And she was talking about loss of language, you know, and, and we can talk about the, all the intentionality of that later on if we want, because I'm going to stop talking in about five minutes. Um, and so they talk about it, loss of language, and she and I loved what she said to us. She says we didn't lose that language; it was beaten out of us. You know, it was beaten out of us. It was we we were hit until it was gone. We were we it was suppressed. You can't say that it was just oh, I lost it on a bus, you know. It was beaten out, and it, it was intentionally assimilated out, you know. And so, when you have those nations, I don't know that we can necessarily we, we can we can we can hold people individually accountable, but we have to also recognize those institutional mechanisms that were built in order to eliminate language, that were built to eliminate sacred history, um, and and that and so there's there's a there's a balance that has to take place in all that, you know. And so I think for the next four minutes, I'll use this model to explain colonization and then explain survival, okay? And so I just think there's so many applications to this that with colonization, the big one that, that the colonial actors go after is always place. That's the first thing that they went for. They went for the land. And they crossed it out. And they said, we're taking that. And so we can talk about that. And <laughs> the second thing that happened, so then you go into like a reservation period. And the second thing that happened is, you know, we can't have these Indians acting all wild and savage and having ceremonies. If they do that, that means they're getting ready for war. Woe is me. So they suppress the ceremony. That's the second thing to do. And then we're done, and then nothing happens. And um, and and I think it was a, a severe underestimation of our people, our relatives, our indigenous relatives, because it completely neglects language and it completely neglects history. And so I think of indigenous sovereignty potentially as the seed that that is uh, dormant for a point because it can't get the nutrients that it needs, and there's a little bit of moisture in there. And there's that DNA in there. And so if you still have a home, you can still speak your language. You can still talk about your sacred history. You can still talk about the, the, the ceremony cycle. You can still talk about the place. And I think that's how we survived. Um, 
And, and so even if you lose your language, let's say you lose your language too, maybe you have to speak about your sacred history in English, but it's something, you know. Um, and maybe you talk about your ceremony cycle in English. It's something, you know. And there's, there's a lot of grad students that are from California, from California tribes, that um, they're, they're working on their PhDs and they're doing the best they can and they don't have their language, they don't have their land, um, they kind of have some memory in different places, not personal, but you know, elders here and there. They have some of that memory that's still in place and they, they kind of try to grab from it and try to bring it back together. And that to me is that little seed, that dormancy that's still there and it's still alive. And I think if we nurture it in the right way, it could bloom again. And so that's why I'm hopeful anyway about uh, indigenous sovereignty going forward. Um, and, just, and, and, and let's just be honest, some nations have it better off than others. And, it's just, and, and so, um, you know, kind of going forward, you know, in, in my dream world is that we come together on these shared interests, that we start to help each other out. We haven't started yet, I don't think. Um, although there is that Standing Rock question. Is that, have you guys heard of Standing Rock yet? Some of you have, yeah. Um, with the No Dapple um, <laughs> movement. Um, it's my understanding that you have some of these indigenous groups that are out there in North Dakota that are coming together under this shared interest that they don't want this pipeline going through the traditional homelands. And it's not just one tribe, it's, it's many people. Uh, Adrian and I are gonna go in, in the second week of November as well. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we're just going to maybe chop wood or something. I don't know, but um, we'll do it, you know, wherever they want to put us to work. So I know I'm excited about getting out there. And um, but I think it's a beautiful thing that we're, we're standing up against big oil and big resource extraction. Um, and I wish I, I wish I saw that more often, you know, that there could be nations that were capable of revitalizing their language and lending that support to other nations that want to do that. Or there could be nations that want to get back into their ceremonial cycle and other nations that have been able to, uh, you know, keep it going, they could pitch in in that way as well. And it, I'll end on this note with um, a lot of people will say, you know, once it's gone, once that elder dies, you know, it's, it's gone. And I've even had medicine people tell me that. It says, once that medicine man goes, it's gone. We'll never have that ceremony again. And I know from a Navajo point of view, I, I kind of, I like to push back, you know, and, and so I'll just say, hey, wait, I got a question for you. What? I thought the holy people taught you those words. I thought the holy people taught you those ceremonies. He's like, yeah, that's true. I said, well, can a baby tomorrow learn it? Even if it's all gone, can't the holy people teach a baby that tomorrow? And they're like, yeah, that might be. <laughs> and I get to push back. And I was like, hmm, there's hope, you know. And so that, that's, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I hope you have some questions. Um, I, have, I have a book for sale. <laughs> but if you want to follow me downtown, I have more books for sale that are locked up in my trunk. Adrian went back to the car and I kept the keys because you know, we're good like that. So, yeah, do you have questions? Do you have, yeah? You can field your own questions. Okay. I guess I'll start. I'll do it myself. Okay, so a former colleague of mine, and you would know him well, David Wilkins. Yeah. Um, a member of the Lumbee tribe. So I used to talk to him an awful lot about his research. And his mantra always was, I really want my research to speak to policymakers mm -hmm. to, to have an effect. Right? Okay, so going from this model, which I really like. I mean, it sort of took me a while to figure out what you're saying, but now I understand it. And I think it's actually pretty cool. Right, so, so suppose that you want to talk about interfacing with the US government, or just sort of a Western government, which is, which is by definition highly litigious. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the problem the Mexicans had with their land when, when the United States took over. Um, and so you have a highly litigious, paper-oriented society that does not think in a single bit, you know, like this. And so, have you thought about, actually two questions, but have you thought about how you take this kind of thinking and try to convince policymakers to change their 
view about um, in, in the way that sovereignty is actually dealt with. Right? Yeah. Um, I think that the policymakers have been very clear in the United States about that they they really want to extinguish indigenous sovereignty. <coughs> and so it's it's kind of a hard sell in a in a zero sum realist world that that we that, that native nations are somehow accommodated, you know, and, and I and and so I think step one is this. That's why I brought this up. Is uh, this is addressed here in chapter two about wrapping up indigenous nations within the U.S. polity? Why would they want to go back and allow international mechanisms to flourish? They would. It's not in the interest of the United States to do that. And so instead, we kind of have to push it in different ways. And so, from my perspective, it's about using international mechanisms again and finding our partners with other native nations around the world and domestically and saying, well, actually we have these treaties in place and in reality, why can't we reshift the norms of interaction in ways that allow for collaboration? Um, and, and you know, it, it almost feels like we could get away with it as if it was one of those issue-oriented international norms like nuclear proliferation or human rights. And that's the way I see it going forward. Right. And it just has to be a norm that we end up shifting, you know, and allowing this functional creep to creep in and say, okay, everybody's doing it now. Try and stop us. There's 568 nations that are moving this direction. Yeah, and so that's sort of yeah. what I, the direction I thought you would go with that question. And so then as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of an indirect follow-up, going back to, I guess, the model that you yeah. had, um, in, earlier in my, in my office we were talking about like, terminated tribes. Yeah. Right, so it seems to me that that that, that model provides in, uh, sort of an interesting way to look at a tribe like the Ponca. Yeah. We're talking about who, who were terminated. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about terminated tribes and then what has happened? Like, like how many of we have actually resurrected themselves? Yeah. So yeah. To speak? Because your model would, pre if you will, would predict resur sort of resurrection is not the right word, but you know. Uh, re re yeah, resurgence, revitalization. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so yeah, uh, Brad and I were talking about terminated tribes. There's a lot of nations in California that were terminated, and again, it kind of goes back to this federal paternalistic model that says, well, here's this class that I just discovered, you are the Davis tribe, and I'm gonna leave you this classroom uh, because I think it's in your best interest, but I'm taking the rest of the university for myself, and I'm gonna do what I want with it. And, uh, and then I'm going to destroy your political economy in the process, so you have to buy everything from your neighbors. So don't, don't grow your own food anymore. Um, and then, lo and behold, I decide about 100 years later, you know what would be in your best interest is if you all just moved out. So I'm going to terminate your tribe unilaterally, and now you're not Davis tribe anymore. You're just citizen A, B, C, D, whatever, whatever your names ended up being. Uh, so move out. You know, and, and that was, that's termination. And, and the, the famous case studies, the well-known the well case studies to me and mine and David Wilkins would be Menominee and Ponca that were, they lost their uh, recognition from the U.S. federal government. Uh, a lot of their land was just sold off. Um, they, they didn't have a land base to go back to, and so they just, I don't know where they came, I don't know where they went. You know, they, they disappeared into urban sprawl somewhere. Um, at the same time that termination was going on, this happened in the 1950s, by the way. It wasn't like 1870, whatever. It's 1950 that, you know what? We're going to emancipate you from your tribal recognition. Good luck. Um, and they'd send them, they'd send, at the same time, they had a relocation policy where they would send individuals to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Minneapolis, and with promises of there's a good job and there's housing. And nine times out of ten, there was no good job and there was no housing and so you're just out there on your own. Um, and a lot of these nations like Menominee and Ponca were able to reestablish themselves as federally recognized. Um, the metric that is used by the U.S. federal government is, is uh, it's pretty high bar, you know, that 
and and it favors Western uh, Western uh, academia. You know, anthropologists have to determine that you have existed from time immemorial until this time of colonization into the now, and you have to have occupied your some portion of your of your land and sort of let it, you know, whatever that means. Um, and, and it keeps shifting. And so that's one of those things is that a lot of nations, they can't pull that off because, you know, their, their attic has been burned down in, in, in addition to losing their traditional homeland. Um, and then the, 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 the U.S. federal government, the, de the Department of the Interior, you know, they drag their feet. And it's, it, to me, it se seems totally intentional. It could take 30, 40 years before they end up making a decision. And, and it's expensive. You know, that um, the fees to make that happen are horribly expensive. So you're not a tribe. You're, I don't know what you're doing for money. I don't know how you guys come together and lead, you know, in your spare time, I guess. And then you come up with the money and then you wait. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's really, you know, stacked against indigenous nations. It's not in the interest of the United States to make more tribes. It's in the interest of the United States to make less tribes. And so um, I don't know that there's a, I can't say for sure that there's practicality in this peoplehood model, but I think um, a lot, you know, it kind of goes back to an individual kind of conversation that at least a lot of these uh, native California individuals have had with themselves and their elders about um, what do I do, you know, and there's, oh, there's these bird songs and it's part of the ceremony, you know, well, try to get a university to get you to study it and write it down and do something you know and and one of my, one of uh one of my colleagues from uc riverside um he kind of put it really bluntly one day he just kind of said you know if, if he were talking about a specific individual named charlie um charlie sepulveda is a is a faculty member at cal poly he just got the job in the fall so he just started this fall finished his phd and uh, his, his uh, dissertation advisor chair, he just kind of looked at us, it's like we're sitting there in the kitchen, he just told us point blank, yeah, Charlie quits, his, his tribe is fucked. <laughs> you know, and it was like, you're right, you know, you're right. And so if Charlie can use this model to help get his nation re-recognized, um, awesome, you know, but, and, and luckily he's young enough where he might survive to see it happen because um, like I said, it's going to take 40 years. I don't know what he's going to do about the money, <laughs> but um, maybe his professional development fund at Cal Poly Pomona will kick in. I don't know. But, um, but there, the challenges are immense, but again, those seeds are probably still there in place. And, and so he, he knows of these bird songs. He knows of that ceremony cycle. I don't think he can sing them, but maybe he can. How does that lead to some practical resurgence? Um, I guess he's got 40 years or so to figure it out. Um, but, you know, he, he's trying. He's doing something with himself instead of nothing. So I'm, I'm, always, uh, I'm always happy to see other warriors out there pushing for themselves and pushing for their people. Because I, I know we're not in it for the money. <laughs> yeah. I, d I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just wondering how one went about doing that. It seems kind of incredibly difficult. And um, I was just wondering what, what, what you had in mind. Yeah. Um, I, the, what, from, what I, from, from what I gather is that I think you have a lot of indigenous youth individuals that are aware of these creation accounts. And they might be afraid to say it more in the open. And so, the, and so I think the seed is there. And then I come along, I'm like, hey, you should do it, you know? And they're like, really? I'm not gonna get in trouble? It's like, no, nope, you're not gonna get your mouth washed out here. It's okay. <laughs> and so I think even that's just enough. And then the second thing is just, you know, writing about it. And so now there's something to cite that says there is a creation account process here. And there is that, I don't feel like I'm special, but I don't know, NAU might think different. And so, 
I'm just trying to put in my two cents. And so, I, and, and so I think those kinds of things are working together. It's, it's, it just sort of needs a, sh a, a nudge. It's not anything bigger than that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Yeah. Yeah, I think indigenous scholars want to do that. It's just, you know, where are the books at? You know, because that's kind of where we start looking. And, and so I'm doing it. Um, let's see. There's, I, I can think, I'm, I'm sort of seeing these book covers in my head, and I can't remember their names. It's like Dancing on the Turtle Back or something like that. There's that book out. Um, there's a, another one I'm looking forward to reading. I, I think one's by McAdams and one's by Simpson. I can't remember the first name. Leanne Simpson I might be it. Um, there's Ray Austin's book on the Navajo courts and Navajo common law. He's got a little bit of indigenous philosophy in there. So it's sort of trickling out there. there I, there's a, um, I thought I saw an indigenous Hawaiian uh, book, I, uh, some name that's super long that I can't pronounce in Hawaiian um, that's out of Minnesota Press. If I could remember the name, I wouldn't be able to pronounce it anyway. Um, but it, that's out there, and so it's, it's emerging, you know, it's emerging out there, and, and there, there are other scholars that are legitimizing these kinds of non-Western thinking processes, and so that, that's, that's another sign of hope as well. So we can point them to those things too. We can point our students and ourselves to those things. Yeah, so I'm glad you're using that stuff. Yeah. It's too bad we can't just take our elders' accounts. We have to validate it with somebody with a diploma. Yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, that was my game. And so you, hopefully, you know, with that second book out, um, I wanted to legitimize uh, medicine people and so uh, I, the only way I could figure out how to do it was I asked a medicine man, Avery Denny, who I worked with pretty closely, I said, can you write a forward? And so we worked on it together. And so now his name's on the cover. And so if you look at that little flyer, it says forward, Avery Denny, he's a medicine man. Um, so he's legitimized now. And um, a lot of people would just sort of show up and ask him for his songs. And he goes, yeah, when I was young, I was dumb, and I just share it. And then they go write a book, and I'm just still here. <laughs> and so he says, well, I got smarter, and I started asking people. Do you, they'd ask me about the mountains, and I'd say, well, do you want to hear lies, or do you want to hear the truth? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, some people won't cite him. They'll just say, yeah, I got these songs from some unnamed informant. And then you have others that say, uh, special thanks to Avery Denny, just somewhere in there. And then you've got others that go a step further and they say, yeah, I got this song from Avery Denny, you know. And I, I just wanted to up the ante and be like, well, just put him on the cover. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, same thing with uh, the, the, the afterword was written by Robert Yazzie, but he's a little more established. He's a, he's a former Chief Justice of the Navajo Nation Supreme Court. And he's pretty famous for utilizing um, peacemaking uh, process, the Navajo peacemaking process to resolve conflicts among families or individuals where they have a disagreement over money or distribution of resources, things like that. Um, but since he worked so closely with me on guiding me in getting these ideas together, um, I wanted to make a space for him too. And so I said, well, go write an afterward. And so, but I made him write his own. I said, you better spell it right this time. So if there's any mistakes, it's his fault, not mine. So yeah. So you talked about the four things that sort of make up this serenity. And you talk about how the colonizers take the place first. So what does the relationship to the place have to be? Do they have to be physically on the place or just they just maintain that spe special relationship to the place? Because you know the place is the colonizers aren't gonna give the place back up. Yeah, they're you know not. What I mean? So what does mm -hmm. that have to be? 
And, and I think our survival, is, is, let's, let's take a terminated tribe, our survival tends to come in those forms of we kind of remember the language and we kind of remember the songs. And we do remember where that traditional homeland is right now, even though we may not legally have access to it. And I think of there, I remember seeing this video that came out of here, UC Davis, I believe it was called Invisible Indians. And um, in that documentary, it was about the indigenous peoples of Mexico that came up into California and did all the migrant labor work. Um, and so that's as far removed as you can get. But I, you know, I imagine they still know their language and I imagine they still know their songs. Um, and I imagine they probably know their traditional homelands better than anybody else. And so they could be removed for a generation and still have that memory that they, you know, maybe one day they can go back home. It's, it's, uh, it's tougher in, so, in a lot of ways down in Latin America, um, but it's different challenges, I should say, than, than recognized and non-recognized people's face here, you know. And, and I could also think of uh, the five civilized tribes that end up removed into Oklahoma, but they still have memory of something, in, you know, in the in the southeast, um, I don't know if that really goes away. You know, just because you get removed from the land, um, sometimes you could be. And, and then there's the other side of it. You could be in your traditional homeland and not have any memory of anything, and you're just you're just extracting, and you're just selling it for under fair market value to the cities for electricity. You have that. Give give away the water. Hurry up. You know, you can't give it away fast enough. So a lot of times. The, the, the causal link between situation where you're at and your relationship to Mother Earth, Father Sky, um, I don't know if it's proximity to your traditional homeland all the time. You know, has, has, there's some work that needs to be done. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. What about these guys in the back? They look all like they're having fun. Hi. I think of the origin of Western sovereignty through, you know, Westphalia and the emergence of those kinds of state systems that kind of, uh, if, I under, if I remember correctly, which I don't always, um, is sort of uh, getting away from monarchic rule and getting into this contemporary sort of the way we think of the state system. I think of that as their creation of story. And that might be more mythological than not in some ways. Um, and. I, what I kind of heard also, and, and maybe I hope I'm understanding you correctly, is I don't know if peoplehood explains the Western sovereign state system, but it does explain the emergence of English as a people and German as a people. They do have those kinds of accounts as well. Um, and I don't pretend to know them, but I know of them. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and you can look at it that way and say, contrasting what did the state sovereign system do to those kinds of attachments that English, German, French people had to their homeland? And I know home would probably argue that it disconnected them. And then they come to the United States. Now they're totally disconnected. They don't give a damn about the land. All they want is whatever they can pull out of it. And so the further you get away from your traditional homeland, the more comfortable you probably are abusing it the more comfortable you are monopolizing the resources. And so I, I know that's not exactly what you asked me, but that's, 
That's the clarification that I see. And I, th does that? That's what I meant. Oh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pick on you. I just wanted to say, like, did I understand? Because I, I look at it this way, and that's really all I meant. But that's exactly what I meant. Okay. To okay. Yes. Yeah. And so I know in home anyway, he talks about having this peoplehood model that I shared with you is called the organic relationship. The resource extraction model is called mechanistic. And it's very common in Indian country anyway for indigenous peoples to have both relationships simultaneously. You know, they'll pray over it, they'll put some corn pollen down, and then they'll pull up some oil and sell it to the, to the, to the market. You know, and, and, the, and, they'll, and they'll say like, well, I put the corn pollen down and that's the offering, and so I'm gonna pull out this oil and it's gonna be all right. See, I just balanced it out. You know, and I'm like, eh, wrong, I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but it kind of does, you know, and, and so, um, but it's, it seems misguided. I think a lot of medicine people would not like that idea that you're, you're trying to put down an offering and then take something with you. It's not like you're putting down an offering and then you take a deer. You know, it's, it, it, I think what they're talking about is putting down an offering and then take all the deer and now there's none left. You know, so it's different, you know. Um, which doesn't make sense from a traditional point of view, and so. Great question, I'm glad you asked it, because I forgot to mention that. Yes, sir. Um, you talked a little bit about cooperation between tribes in terms of now often the federal government, so it's kind of, it's, you know, there's some examples now it seems to be getting better than it has been previously. Is that because of an attitude change or a sort of a change in the way tribes are kind of dealing with each other, or is it just because people have now got some technology so they can connect, can connect to each other easier? What's kind of driving that cooperation now? Um, I'm not sure the cooperation is getting better. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, and I, and the, I guess my point was that you have these interesting episodes where cooperation just happens, mm -hmm. you know, and I wish that cooperation was actually getting better. Um, but I think one example might be um, there was a point in, I think, 2011 where um, the president of the Navajo Nation was trying to do a water settlement, which I end up calling a water giveaway to uh, Phoenix. And it's the same old stuff where you, we're gonna, Navajo Nation is going to sell its water rights for way under fair market value to some metropolitan um, uh, entity. And typically these things just happen and nobody notices until it's too late. But in 2011, a lot of Navajo youth activists got together and they fought it and they defeated it. And I think they used social media to do so. And that's one of those mechanisms. Um, and I think that's why Standing Rock and Brad, I think summed it up real nicely where he said, it's the biggest story that nobody's talking about. And the only reason that we know about it probably in this room is through social media. Um, and so that's one of those, one of those mechanisms where we, we can finally come together and say, well, let's have some cooperation. And we've had other episodes like that too with um, like the boarding school era, relocation era. We get indigenous peoples from various tribes that come together. We speak a common language and we have a common cause. And then you have a red power movement, you know? that coincides with the civil rights movement. And so you have these interesting episodes where that takes place. And, it, it, and, and it's, my, it's my dream anyway that we start to use these, these social media mechanisms to you know, make it happen even quicker. You know? um, but I can dream. So yeah, th does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and so that, that, I think that's the mechanism for cooperation going forward. But it's also the idea that we're we're, we're still sort of talking past each other about, well, how do we do this? Do we vote our way out? <laughs> do we burn it down? Do we, what do we do, you know? And, and, and that, that conversation needs to happen. That, um, how, what is our strategy, you know? And does it change based on resource extraction versus education versus uh, c civil rights, you know? So th those kinds of conversations still have to happen. Then we can have more cooperation. I, I, yeah, you had a, I had a side comment yeah. about the oh, go ahead. of cooperation and the social media being uh, mm -hmm. part of it. 
I was at Standing Rock in September, and it's very hard to get cell phone service there. Mm -hmm. And I actually felt more disconnected when I was in one of the camps than when I was in front of my computer because mm -hmm. the information wasn't traveling very well. And also, um, when you are near the protest side or near the front lines, I shouldn't call it protest side because it's not a protest, it's a protection. So when they were, when we were near the front lines, um, they're, they are now using drones and other mm -hmm. mechanisms to stop the cell phone yeah. service. And even Facebook is stopping mm -hmm. uh, live streams. And mm -hmm. So as, the, as we have more mechanisms of cooperation, we also have more mechanisms of oppression. Mm -hmm. That that's, it's not unlike the Arab Spring, where you have all these mechanisms where they they can sh they, the government can shut down the media, they can shut down the technology. You think it's happening somewhere else? It's happening right here in your backyard, and and so I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Um, so yeah, it's happening right here in your backyard. But that doesn't mean we quit. <laughs> Um, it, de it depends on who you ask, obviously. So from a Western perspective, it's obviously land, yeah. But Holm would talk about it normatively as these are all equal interlinking pieces and you really need all four in order to make the foundation stand. And when you lose one, it starts to crack that foundation. So it just depends on your epistemology that you're coming at this from. Um, unfortunately, like I said, from the Western point of view, it's always going to be land. Do you have land? All right, then. I don't want to talk to you. Um, and really, sadly, it's not only do you need land, but typically in order for anybody to have interest in you is because you have natural resources and you're willing to sell them for dirt cheap. And so I, I know that's not necessarily answering the question as you asked it, but that that's, tends to be the way that we get recognized nowadays. Um, does that answer your question, though? I know it sort of sidesteps it, but maybe I can try again. Yeah, I'm just interested in when you when you talked about you could have the memory but no land, and you'd still be yeah a, a, a people. But you, if you have the land with no memory, then you're you're a little bit lost. And so it just seemed like the, the memory was significantly more important than the the land itself. And and maybe you're right. Um, and I just haven't thought about it like that. Um, but. Um, it's, it's, it's real. It's, it's just, it's just the reality, I guess, that I see nowadays in a lot of indigenous communities where they can have the land, they physically occupy the land, and yet they may not utilize it in a way that maybe they could, you know. And I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, I know that I, I briefly mentioned it sort of as a, as a snark about, well, we're going to destroy your political economy so you can't feed yourself. And that that's really is the answer to that in a lot of ways. It's that you could be trapped in Indian country. And some people call it that, you know, like, I'm trapped. And I don't like it, but they're not really wrong. Um, they're, the jobs are tough. The political economy does not exist, really. You have these informal economies that function. But the reality is that you have, you've got these border town economies that have been heavily supported and subsidized in proximity to Indian country so that they draw the dollars out and into the border town economy. And that's a tough, that's a tough beast to go up against. Um, and so if you can't feed yourself, you can't do much more than that. You know, you, it's, it's tough to remember if you're just trying to eat every day. It's tough to retain the land if you're just trying to eat every day. Um, and if your challenges are, that you face are that, that big and that basic that I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat anything besides really salty commodity food, um, you don't have time to, you know, or energy to, 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 learn, to learn songs, to really cultivate that memory, to really um, have a good relationship with your traditional homeland, you know. Um, and so I don't deny that either. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, a lot of Indian country is literally a food desert. If you, got, if you guys know what that phrase means, food desert, you have to drive like 100 miles or more to get something fresh. 
there are communities out there in Indian country where your only source of local food is a gas station with corn dogs, you know, and fried burritos and chips. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, when you when that's your when that's potentially your diet for the day, it's kind of hard to go beyond that. And so, I I don't I don't deny or discount that. That's a, that's an immense challenge that exists. Um, so, yeah, that 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 affects our memory. <laughs> um, there's that scholar I can never pronounce his name. Um, he used to go by the name Gerald Alfred, but now he spells it T Taiki. Thank you, Taiki Alfred. The, uh, and he's got his book, um, which I also can't pronounce, called Wasase or something like that. W-A-S-A-S-E, I think it is. There's an accent over the second A. Wasase. Um, and he's got an intro about this idea of cultural blank spaces, I think is what the phrase that they used. And Adrian and I were actually talking about it a few weeks ago, saying there's, a, there's this interesting cultural amnesia that's going on and you know kind of feeds into your question as well that we kind of forgot you know our relationships um and we you know we're, it's supposed to be mother earth that we you know father sky mother earth father sky that we have a good relationship with but you know for the last hundred years it seems like a lot of people in indian country are treating mother earth like an atm machine you know and just taking and taking and taking they're not putting anything back um, but again, if, you, if all your food sources are salty and bad for you, I don't know. Of course we're gonna, we're gonna forget things. Of course we're gonna have that cultural amnesia. Um, that, was, that was our phrase I think we were playing with, like cultural amnesia, something like that, some traditional ecological knowledge gaps or something, I'm, I don't know. We were sort of playing with it the other, day, the other week. Um, but, um, and it's real, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, and it and it's it has it has an immense impact on our on our relatives. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you see the organic and mechanistic relationship models as mutually exclusive? No. Can they coexist together in such a way that people can subsist and still have their yeah. traditional or organic relationship? That's tougher. Yeah. Um, no, I, I did see them as overlapping. I think um, the best example of that is the Hopi Navajo land dispute. Because you have traditional folk from Hopi and Navajo that are capable of understanding and remembering their traditional relationship to Mother Earth, Father Sky. And then you've got another faction that's in there that their, their, their relationship is actually mechanistic. And then you've got the majority of people that are just both. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna put down corn pollen, but I need somewhere to graze sheep. So there's some land, go get it. You know, and, and then you end up with another tribe that comes in and says, I'm confiscating all your cattle. And so you just messed me up in my contemporary political economy. I gotta take these <coughs> cattle to market. You know, and now you've ruined me for the, for the, for the season and potentially for the rest of your life. <coughs> Um, you've got self, you've got these interesting self removal policies, you know, not self removal. You've got, but you've got these interesting indigenous removal policies where it's like, well, you know, why don't you go live down the road in Sanders where there's uranium, uranium all over, you know, that's great, uranium. They didn't tell them that until they did, they got out there, and so you have removed people that live in Sanders in a uranium cesspool, <laughs> you know. Um, great, wonderful, um, but that that sort of um, gets at the mixing of having both mechanistic and organic relationships. Um, another one of, of answering that question, it's it's in here on chapter chapter seven is economic liberalism and sustainable colonization. The idea that you in the 1930s. You have, you have decimated political economies in Indian country um, and tribal leaders that it seems like they're really conflicted and they're saying, well, what do I do? I need, my people need to eat, what do I do? And these resource extraction companies are here and they wanna buy the oil. They wanna lease the land for 25 years and they wanna pull out oil and, and a lot of them reluctantly go along with it. And it seems like they're legitimately conflicted about it. It's like, 
maybe this will get us through this generation and then we can get back. And we just never got back, you know? And so having those things um, not conflict with each other, I'm, I, I'm having a hard time figuring out how that works, you know? And I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying I'm having a hard time. It's like, I don't know. It seems very contradictory, but it certainly coexists right here, right now. Yeah. That was a good question. I liked it. Can I go home now? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no more questions. I'd like I'm to dizzy. thank, I think that we're almost at the end of time. So yeah. I'd like to thank uh, Michael for a really interesting talk. So thanks a lot, Michael. I appreciate it. Thanks.